Tonight we're in, in uh, Luke chapter 18. Let's begin reading together here in Luke 18 at verse 35. I'll read verses 35 to uh, verse 43, and, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 35. Luke writes, It happened as he was coming near Jericho that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. We know that Jesus is on his way to the city of Jerusalem. As I mentioned last time we were together, since chapter 9 of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has been making his way to the city of Jerusalem. And so now he's on his approach there. He's in, in the uh, outskirts of the city of, Jer of Jericho, which is just outside of Jerusalem. He's going there at this time because he's there to observe the Passover. And uh, that's the reason he's going, because he, as the Passover lamb, is about to be sacrificed. As he's been approaching the city of Jerusalem, he's been spending time with his disciples. He's been instructing them concerning principles of the kingdom of God. We know that he has been sharing with them concerning his upcoming death as well as his resurrection. And we also know that he's been sharing with them concerning the key to greatness in the kingdom of God. And he's made it very clear that the key to being great in God's kingdom is humble service. We saw that last time we were together. But now he's going to teach them another lesson. He's going to teach them something that's very important for believers to learn. It's the lesson that we all need to learn. It's the lesson of compassion. He's about to teach them something about what love really is because the kingdom of God is to be inhabited by people who are compassionate, people who love God and love other people. And compassionate concern for others is going to make God's kingdom extremely unique in the world that we inhabit. That's because the world that we live in is filled with busyness and, and filled with self-interest. And it's unusual for somebody to actually take the time to have compassion, a genuine compassion, on somebody else. Yet the Bible makes it very clear that the kingdom of God is filled with those who have love for others and, and those who take the time to minister to people who are in need. We know that that's a command that we've received from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that Paul gave to us in Galatians in chapter 6, verse 10, where he said, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And this is just something that we as Christians understand and know. But you see, it's possible to believe that Jesus died for our sins and at the same time to think that humble service is really not necessary. Though we may agree that humble service may be necessary, it's still possible to fail to exercise compassion. And so what we're seeing here is Jesus sharing again about this important trait in the life of a believer, to have compassion on those who are hurting. And so as we look at this, notice with me how, how Luke begins. It happened in verse 35, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. And so there's a blind man there seated at the side of the road, and he hears the commotion. He hears the sound of people traveling towards Jerusalem. Now, as as he notes here, I want you to see this, verse 36, it says that there's a multitude passing by. So the question has to be asked, 
Who are these people? Who, who, who are these people? What, what is constituting this multitude? And what we have is we have pe people who are pilgrims. And these are pilgrims who are traveling to Jerusalem in order that they might celebrate the Passover. I look at it in a sense as, as like a, uh, if you will, uh, uh, it's a parade. And, and it's a parade that, that some might, might even refer to as, as a Christian parade. It's a parade of people, a group of people on their way to Jerusalem. They're there um, amongst Jesus' uh, Jesus's disciples. There are a group of people who have joined the disciples of Jesus Christ, and they're now traveling together on the road to, there to Jerusalem. And, and I see that not only here in this passage where it's possible to have people who are followers of Christ, but also people who are not necessarily committed to him, who basically are joining the group of those who do. You see that all the time. You see it all the time in, in, in the church in the 21st century. We have people who, who are, are not believers, general, genuine believers, who, who will go to Christian concerts because their friends invite them to, and they'll go to the concert, or, or they may go to an event at a church, and, and they're basically there uh, to, to see what's going on and all. Uh, sometimes Christian concerts actually attract what I call spiritual junkies who come for a charge. They come because uh, of this particular concert is something that they like. The music is something they listen to, and so they'll show up for a Christian concert concert. And, and a lot of times there are people who go to those concerts who aren't believers at all. There are times that people will go to the crusades. Um, there, you know, Billy Graham, when he used to do his crusades, very often uh, wanted to have people there who didn't know the Lord, obviously, so that he could reach them with the gospel. But there were those who were professing, professing uh, Jesus Christ who, who would go to those crusades too, but they acted even worse than the world acted. I, I can remember a friend of mine who was sharing with me many years ago now how that when Billy Graham did a, a, a a Billy Graham crusade here in Anaheim, so it's been a long time ago, when Billy Graham was here in Anaheim doing his, his crusade, this friend of mine was telling me how that there on the field they had uh, gates that were closed, and then all these Christians who were standing there by the gates were waiting uh, for the gates to open up so they could enter into the field, and so uh, they were standing there waiting, and, and when the gates finally opened up, they were throwing elbows and knocking people out of the way as they were running to jump into the chief seat in order that they could sit there and then listen to Billy Graham talk about the love of God and how you should be compassionate to other people. It just blows my mind, but it's true. And, and that's what happens so very often. I mean, you have people acting extremely carnal at crusades. You can see the carnality sometimes at Christian concerts. Some are celebrity seekers. They're, they're the people who come to a retreat or they'll come to a, an event if someone special is there. If it's just an average person, uh, they, they won't be there. But if somebody is special, they're going to make every effort to be there. I see that all the time. I, I, I hate to speak ill, and it sounds like I'm speaking ill of our own fellowship, but I can tell you this. I can tell you that if I got up on a Sunday and I said, um, you know, this upcoming Wednesday night we're going to be having, and then I just mentioned somebody that everybody knows. If I were to stand up and say some special person, somebody that everybody knows, uh, as a famous Christian, I guarantee you we'd have to bring out chairs so that the people who never come to church in the midweek, we have to, so we could accommodate them. I can tell you that there's no doubt in my mind about that at all. That happens. That can happen. If I say, you know, Billy Graham's in town and he's going to be here on Wednesday night, and if I said that even on our own Sunday morning, if I said, Billy Graham, I know he doesn't teach anymore and I know he doesn't preach anymore, but Billy's going to be here on Wednesday night, guys. I guarantee you everything would be flooded with people who want to come to hear that great man speak the Word of God. And there are many. Unfortunately, it's true. It's true in our fellowship. It's true in every church that I can name. There are many who are celebrity-oriented. If somebody special is going to be there, I want to be there. And they forget that the most special guest that they'll ever be able to be in the presence of is Jesus Christ, and he is here every time we gather together as a body of Christ. But they don't care that much because they really would like to see Billy Graham. I can tell you that it's true, and you know it's true too. People will do everything they can to be near a celebrity. They will go out of their way. They will break their back. They'll hurry from work. They'll, they'll rush to eat their dinner. They will make sure that they're there, and sometimes in the very front row. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen people in our fellowship that I hardly see at all suddenly appear at an event. And, and I've learned that over the years, that if it's, if it's something like that, the church shows up. 
Sometimes they'll come to conferences. They come to conferences because um, the interesting subject will draw a crowd, a, a crowd of people who love information but have yet to experience transformation. You see that all the time. You can see that in ministry. You can see the mixed groups, those who are following Christ who want to learn the lessons of how to be a Christian and others who simply are part of that group. And, and so I see it as, as what I would call a Christian parade, and that's what's taking place. Verse 36 speaks of, of this man hearing a multitude passing by. So he hears a group of people, and, and he begins to wonder, who are these people? What's going on in all of that? I think that two of the greatest hazards in large churches today uh, are, one, the attraction of spectators, people who like big for its own sake. The idea that they seem to have is more is better, but they never really want a ch church family. They don't want to join it. And second, uh, what happens is you can actually have people in a large church begin to treat the pastor teacher as a celebrity. And what happens is that pastor teacher ceases being a pastor and suddenly becomes a, uh, just a guest in his own pulpit. And, and the result of that is that he becomes that guest speaker developing not a ministry but a following, and that's dangerous. These people who have mixed with Jesus' disciples are followers who enjoy a festive environment. But they're about to be exposed to something that's real. They're going to be exposed to genuine religion. They're going to be exposed to love in action. Because as Jesus is ministering, he's not about to be distracted from his mission. And so this is what's taking place. Now, note with me again in verse 35 how, how Luke leaves this man unnamed. Notice he simply says, a certain blind man. He leaves him unnamed. But if you cross-reference Luke's account with Mark in chapter 10, verse 46, Mark tells us the name of this man. This man's name is Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Now, Bar in Hebrew simply means son of. Bartimaeus simply means son of Timaeus. And Timaeus speaks of a, that which is highly prized. And so Bartimaeus is the name of the individual who is there. Now Matthew, when you look at Matthew's account, Matthew adds in chapter 20 verse 30 that there are really two blind men. But both Luke and Mark zero in on Bartimaeus because Bartimaeus is recognized here as the spokesman. It's not that they are ignoring the fact that there were two men. It's simply that they're zeroing in on, on Bartimaeus and recognizing him as the one who is speaking. And so what happens is the approaching crowd has drawn their attention, Bartimaeus in particular. Now, he might have become excited as he hears a great crowd approaching. He might have been thinking within himself, and I'm sure he was, this is a great crowd of people. And as pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem, undoubtedly, because they're religious people, they're going to be generous people. Because overwhelmingly, here in the United States, it's easily proven that the most generous people in the United States are those people of faith, those who have religious faith. They are by far the most generous people because not only do they pay their taxes, which goes to our government, which is used for various systems to help those who are poor, but they also voluntarily give of their substance in charitable things. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And so he knows that the mark of a truly religious person is generosity. He hears a crowd of people coming his way. And as he hears the sound of festivity and, and all the, the loud voices, perhaps the excitement, he begins to wonder what's going on. And that's what it says in verse 36. He asks what it meant. What's going on here as I hear the sound of all of these people excitedly approaching me? Well, Luke tells us in verse 37, they told him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cries out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So he hears that it's Jesus of Nazareth. And as he hears that it's Jesus, notice how Luke tells us he cries out. It's his opportunity. It's finally arrived. He's not going to allow that to pass him by. He has heard, undoubtedly, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the miracle-working power of this man from Nazareth. 
Undoubtedly, he's heard of Jesus Christ, how that Jesus has the ability to do works and miracles. There's no doubt in his mind because the pilgrims have passed by and Jesus has been ministering for three years and undoubtedly many times as, as he's been there, he's heard stories of, of this one named Jesus who can open the eyes of the blind and his, his opportunity is finally gathered. He, he, it's there for him and, and he's, he's hearing that it's Jesus of Nazareth. He begins to scream, he begins to cry out because he doesn't want this opportunity to get past him. This is my best hope in, it, in essence. This is the best hope that I'll ever have, he'd be thinking, of ever regaining my sight. And so what does he do? He shouts at the top of his lungs. He's not going to be silent for anything. He wants to cry over the loud crowd about him. He makes sure that his voice is going to be heard. Psalm 77, verses 1 and 2 reads, I cried out to God with my voice, to God with my voice, and he gave ear to me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My hand was stretched out in the night without ceasing. My soul refused to be comforted. I cried out. What a picture. There's this man, this blind man, seated on the side of the road. The Christian parade begins to pass him by. He asks the question, what does this mean? Somebody in the crowd says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Something inside of him goes off. He doesn't know exactly where Jesus would be in the mix of all of these people. And he's not about to take a chance of being passed over. So he begins to scream at the top of his lungs. And as he begins to scream, it's a simple cry, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But I want you to see something here, and we're going to look at this. Notice verse 39. Those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. The crowd does not appreciate the disturbance. They want him to quiet down. Sometimes even believers will let people remain crippled. Sometimes the politely religious don't have a clue about how somebody could be hurting so badly that they make a disturbance and actually interrupt their life. There are quite a number of people that I've encountered over the years that become ingrown like that. Ingrown groups have a tendency of doing that. Religion is a polite experience. It's, it's something that we kind of do quietly and, and amongst ourselves. We certainly don't want a mess in church. We don't want people to make noise and to disturb us and all. And, and what happens is the group becomes ingrown. And we forget the whole reason why a church exists. It's to reach people like the blind Bartimaeuses of the world who are hurting in need of a touch from Jesus Christ. I was a brand new Christian once when I was 20 years old. I had a friend of mine named Jim and he was in the military at that time. It was before I went into the army and he was on leave and he came home on leave and, and he had some time and so he and I decided to go together up to this place that I still go to to this day called San Luis Obispo. And he and I took a, a ride up to San Luis Obispo. We had a friend who lived up there. We were going to go visit him, sp spend some time with him. And, uh, and I'd been sharing with Jim about the love of Christ and all, and I wanted Jimmy to, to get saved. And, and so I saw it as an opportunity. I saw it as an opportunity to, to go with a friend of mine and to share with him some of the things that the Lord was doing in my life. I was freshly saved myself. I hadn't been saved more than a month, a month and a half. And so off we go to San Luis Obispo together. And, and as we were there... Just, uh, just outside of Pismo and Arroyo Grande in that area, uh, they have uh, a pier, and, uh, and he and I went to this particular place, They're just, just uh, south of, of, of the city of San Luis Obispo, and we, we were walking on the pier. And as we were walking on the pier, um, there was a, a guy there who had dropped some traps, and he was, he was catching some live crab, and, and he was going to... Uh, you know, use them later on, eat them and all of that. And so as we were walking on, on the pier, we walked up to him. Now, again, I'm a brand new Christian, and there's this guy on the end of the pier, and just this one guy and Jim and I, and as we're walking by, 
Uh, the guy says, hey, guys, how are you? And, and I looked at him, and I said, we're great. He says, what are you guys doing? He's a real friendly guy. He says, what are you guys doing? And I said, you know, we're just standing here on the dock of the bay, you know, watching the tide roll away. No, I said, um, I said, we're just standing here. I don't know where that came from, but anyway, we're just, we're just standing here. I said, just enjoying the beauty of the creation of God. He looks at me and he goes, are you a Christian? And I said, I, I am. He says, so am I. His name was John Baxter. I still remember his name, though I only met him once and only know him from this event. His name was John Baxter. He says, you're a believer. I said, yes. He says, how long have you been a Christian? I said, I just got saved. It had been like a month. He goes, really? He said, how'd you get saved? And I, I said, well, I was at the Hollywood Palladium, and it was uh, Arthur Blessed was giving the word of God, and, and Pat Boone was there with his white shoes and daughters. And, and, uh, and as I was talking to him, he says, I played. I played at that at that concert there at the Hollywood Palladium. He says, I'm a musician. I did my music. I shared some of my songs there. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no. He says, I live up here, and as a matter of fact, tonight, I'm going to be sharing at a local church. He says, you guys ought to show up, and, you know, and, and, and I said, you know, we'll be there. So he says, well, why don't you come over to my mother-in-law's place and, and uh, eat some crabs with us, and then we'll go to church. And I said, sounds cool to me. And so that's what we did. So we went. I'd never eaten crab in my life and all, but he made the crab, and we ate it, and off we go to this small church there in the city. And as we're there, we walk in. And I have to tell you, you know, I was, I was a barefooted hippie still and long hair and the whole nine yards. And, and we go walking in. And, and I was 20 and Jimmy was 20 years old. And as we walked in, you know, it's a, it's a youth group and John does his music. And, and uh, there were these two girls that were there, high school age girls. And, and uh, they came walking up to us. And it's like we were new guys. They'd never seen us before. So they walked up to us and they started talking to us. And to be honest, with you, they started flirting with us. In reality, they were trying to pick us up. And so we're just standing there talking to these girls, and, and, and as we're talking to them, you know, it's kind of obvious what they're doing. They're telling us a bunch of stuff that we really didn't need to hear and, and, and all. And, and as they're saying this, you know, we're just looking at them and talking to them and letting them, you know, kind of wrap on. And, and when they finish talking, they said, where are you guys from? And, and I started talking. You know, I was a mature believer. I was already a month old in Christ. And so I, so I said, you know, we're from down south, and I just gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I looked at the girls, and I said, have you done that? Have you given your heart to Jesus Christ? Are, your, are you born again? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know that God can save you? Do you know that he'll forgive you of your sins? He'll cleanse you and give you a brand new life? Do you know that? Have you experienced that? And, and I told, I remember telling, I said to this girl, this one girl in particular, I said, do you know that God loves you and that God will forgive you of every sin you've ever committed? Do you know that God just forgave me of my sins and I've got a new life? And she starts to cry and she runs away and she runs into the bathroom and her little girlfriend goes running after her. So these two girls are in the, in the bathroom crying in there. So Jim and I go and stand waiting at the bathroom for them to come out so we can go into chapter 2. And, 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 and they do. They come out. They come out. And this little girl's eye makeup, you know, she had her eyes all, you know, all of this goop and everything all over her eyes. And it was all, all messed up. She looked like a little fox, you know. And, and she comes walking out. And, 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 and I keep talking to her. We kept sharing the love of Christ. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so they said, we're kind of embarrassed to talk in here. So we walked outside with them. And, and they were real genuine. They were real open and just kept on sharing. This is what Christ can do in your life. But as that was taking place, one of the girls from the youth group came walking out of the door and stopped quickly, turned around and walked back into the, into the church. And and Jimmy and I exchanged glances, kept talking to the girl, and shared with them. And it was time for us to leave. We said goodbye to John and his wife, and we went to our friend's house. And then Jimmy began to speak to me. And Jimmy said, you know, you know what that girl was doing. She was coming out to see if we took off with, with those girls. She was coming to see because we had been introduced by John as believers in Jesus, as Jesus freaks. And they came out just to see if we we're taken off with these girls because those girls obviously had a reputation in that church. And I said, yeah, I know. You see, ingrown people have a tendency of not seeing what's really there. Crying needs to them 
are, are just disturbances. They're just things that you have. Girls like that in youth groups are more of a problem and you know, it would be just as good as if they were gone because it wouldn't be so messy around here because what an embarrassment. These girls try and pick up on the guys who show up and it's just better for them to go. Ingrown people are that way. They truly are. God help us not to be that way, but it is possible. You see, th these are people who are literally walking with Jesus and yet they're callous to the pain of other people. Again, it's, it's like people today, many today, they picture a, a walk with Jesus Christ as sanitary and uneventful, and, and they don't realize that they're saved to help people who are hurting. And so they have little compassion on those who do not seem to get it together. Hurting people are quite disturbing to those who forget what they are and what they were. And those who have needs are simply told to be quiet because pain, especially pain that's exposed in church, can be so messy. And people who are different from us make us uncomfortable. I, again, as a, a relatively young believer, by this time I was out of the military. I'd been a Christian three years. I was at a church and uh, had been part of their college and career age group. And we used to sit on the floor there, hippies used to do that, and we would sing music out of a hymnal. They didn't have a guitar player leading us in Maranatha choruses or things like that. We had hymnals, and as I was holding on to the hymnal, it had 150 songs, and, and one of the guys would say, what do you guys want to sing? and people will yell out the name of the song. Let's sing Amazing Grace. It's on page 42. It only had 150 pages. And every week I'd do the same thing. I'd say, let's sing from page 151. And everybody would go, there's no 151, there's only 150. And then I'd go, oh, ho, ho, I thought I was rather clever. <laughs> or I'd say, let's sing Stairway to Heaven. You know, I just like to mess with them. But as I was there, there was a guy I was seated next to, I don't remember his name, but I do know that this was a guy who was what we used to call a red freak. Now, how many people know that term? Raise your hand. I want to say, okay, you guys are young. Thank God you don't know. Reds are barbiturates, Lily F40s, candy reds. I mean, there are so many different kinds. This guy was a red freak. It's a downer. You take two or three and you're kind of like out of it. It's got an amazing ability to make you think you weigh 500 pounds and you're the toughest guy around. That's what reds do. That's why all my friends were always bloodied up and because they, oh, are you looking at me? Yeah, pow, and then the guy's asleep. You know, that's kind of how it works, you know. Reds, I used to take my share of them. Not all the time. I didn't really like them that much, but I had my experience with them and had friends who were red freaks, and I, I knew that life. It wasn't that far you know, before that I used to do that. I, I, one of the things that led me to getting saved was I dropped five reds and drank almost a half gallon of wine and o almost OD'd. I almost died from that. I know that life. I, I was part of it, right? And so I'm seated next to a guy who could have been me just a few years before who had just gotten saved. And he's seated right next to me, and I'm, I'm there. And, and we would read out of this hymnal these songs, and we would sing. Well, it's one of these songs that, that you have one of these breaks. You know, you're singing, uh, da, 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 and then you go on again, right? Well, this guy was new. He didn't know that you're supposed to wait. And he just sang on through the next line, and he's the only voice. And to be honest with you, he couldn't sing very well. And, and he, but he sang at the top of his lungs. He had all that joy of being saved. And as he sang out of the top of his lungs and sang the line, you know, this was a guy who, I have to be honest with you, didn't fit in with this particular group of people I was hanging with at that time. And, and there was that snickering and there was that sneering and there was those sidelong glances and there was that mocking that takes place. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm judging those whom I loved very much. But it was, it was inappropriate. It made him feel very bad. It made him feel very foolish. And as I was seated there, 
I remember looking at this guy thinking this. I've never forgotten this. I was 23 years old. I am more like him than I am all of my friends because I understand him. My friends were raised in the church. This was a long-established church. It wasn't a Calvary Chapel, but it was a long-established church. It had been in the community a long time, and my friends had been raised in the church. They didn't understand this guy, and I did. I, I been there, done that, understand that, and it hit me. I am more like him than I am like my friends here. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we just have never made the effort to understand. I am one of these people who I've been saved now for, since I was 20, I'm 57, almost 37 years. Almost 37 years. Almost two-thirds of my life has been spent serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you know I haven't forgotten I have not forgotten what it's like to wake up with a hangover. I haven't forgotten. At this age, I haven't had alcohol in so many years, I can't tell you exactly how long. But I, don't, I, I haven't forgotten what that's like. I haven't forgotten what it's like to, 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 to be depressed and to feel all of the stuff that people, in, I haven't. I, when I got saved, I asked the Lord, help me to remember what you saved me from. So I never forget when I talk to somebody else. Help me not to become self-righteous. You know, how can you be that way? How can you think that way? I, I did that. For the grace of God, I would be doing that and even worse now. Because sin doesn't go away. You don't outgrow it. You refine it. You refine it. And, and I know that. And the path my life was taking was messy, like yours perhaps was. Messy. Shame to my parents. Shame to my family, my sisters and my brother. Shame to those who knew me. I haven't forgotten that. I'm not that way now, and I haven't been that way for many years. But I haven't forgotten. I encourage you, don't forget where you came from. You can tell when you're beginning to forget. It's when you begin to say things like, when are they going to get it? When are they going to learn? When are they going to understand? How long will I put up with you? That's when you've forgotten where you came from. That's a sign that you don't remember what you were like. And I have to tell you, there are quite a number of people who don't understand that. We were given a Bible study. I was given a Sunday morning service many, many years ago. And I shared something during the service that caused somebody who was there in the congregation. It was while we were in Ontario Christian Elementary School. There was an older gentleman who was seated directly up the center aisle to my right, about six or seven rows back. I still remember, off to my left, right there, six or seven rows back. And while I was sharing, I gave an illustration, and when I gave the illustration, I heard somebody very loudly moan with a, a sob, a loud sob, a pain sob, a tearful sound. It came from his gut. And I heard him as he moaned out loud. And, and the reason I knew who did it is because directly behind him was a young couple who looked at each other. They looked at each other. And so I, I could see the movement. And I looked and it focused my attention there. And they both got up and hurried out and walked out. And I'm not exaggerating when I say they stood up and hurriedly walked out and left the church. I never saw them again after that. But I did wonder what happened. So, of course, I inquired, and it turns out that this man, his son, had just died. I said something in the message that brought the memories up of his boy, and he cried. Listen, 
If you can't cry in church, where can you cry? If you're not safe in the body of Christ, then where are you safe? And if you don't have people who will put their arms around you and weep with you, then it's not a church. It's a club. It's just a fraternity. It's a social organization. But when you have a tear and somebody knows how to weep with those who weep, you've got a brother or you've got a sister. You've got somebody who understands pain, and that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. That's what we are supposed to be. May God help us to remember that because the church trend today is away from the messy things that happen or people who are actually disturbing to me, they're not like me. How can they show up in this place? Because this is a hospital. Because it's a place where hurting cripples are welcome so that they can be touched by Jesus Christ. That's why, that's what the body of Christ is supposed to be, isn't it? That's what we are as the church. God help us not to forget. Because you can get so caught up with the busy parade, even walking alongside of Jesus Christ, and the minute a need shows its face, the first thing you want to do is you want to say, be quiet. That's what took place here. Look, and you, you see it with me. It says here that those who went, in verse 39, who went before warned him that he should be quiet. Be quiet. Remain blind. Lose your opportunity to see. Don't disturb my peace. Just be quiet. But his response, he cried out all the more. And he shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. I am not about to lose my opportunity. I might never have one like this again. Jesus is on his way to die on the cross. Jesus isn't going to pass by again. This is his last time as he walks by Jericho. He's not going to lose his opportunity. The psalmist in Psalm 6, verse 2 cried out, Have mercy on me, O Lord, I'm weak. Oh, Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. And so as he begins to cry out, verse 40, Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. The crying had gotten the attention of the Lord Jesus Christ as well as everybody else. In Psalm 18, verse 6, the psalmist said, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. Psalm 88, verse 2, Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear unto my cry. The parade, as it's moving along, comes to a sudden halt. Jesus Christ, as he stops you can see everybody stop along with him. And he turns and he says, bring that man to me. That's what we're supposed to be doing, by the way, is bringing people to Christ. Bring him to me. And so they do. They bring him. The whole parade stops for one person because Jesus Christ is willing to stop everything as he's reaching you. Now, Mark tells us in chapter 12, verse 50, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Now, that's an important thing that Luke didn't add, but he discards something that might stumble him as he comes to Jesus. That garment could have tripped him up. Earlier, a rich young ruler would not let go of his wealth and was stumbled by that. Some people stumble over things they're not willing to leave behind. They stumble over boyfriends because, my goodness, if I come to know Jesus Christ and actually serve him, then this, this guy that I care so much about or this girl that I care so much about is going to no longer be with me, and I'd rather be with them 
than with the Lord. They stumble over losing relationships. Some people are afraid because if their husband or their wife finds out that they're following the Lord, that, that they may be rejected or their children may not want to be with them or have anything to do with mom and dad or their parents may reject them. They, they, they because they're afraid of, of, of losing relationships with things, they're stumbled over them and refuse to come to Christ. I came to Jesus Christ. I left everything. I was willing to. I was willing to. I was willing to, if, if necessary, lose everything because that's what the Lord had called me to do. He said, come and follow me. And that's what I did. But I left everything. I left everything. My parents, but I came back for them. I came to him, but I came back for them. Because once I had him, I wanted them to have him too. Once I had Jesus, I wanted to make sure that with every beat of my heart, I would be so transformed that my, my mom and my dad would come and follow the one that I had let go of everything for that I might have him. So he let it go because nothing's going to stumble him as he comes to Christ. And though he is physically blind, Yet, with his spiritual eyes, he can see who Jesus is, and it comes to him. Paul in Philippians, in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, said, What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And so as he comes to the Lord, Jesus says, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do for you? Now, when you consider Jesus' question at first, it would seem pretty obvious what he needed. He needed to receive his sight. You know, he didn't say, well, I, you know, I need a garment. I just left it behind. No, it's pretty obvious what he needs. He needs his sight. And yet... Sometimes we need to be specific in our requests. This upcoming Sunday, I'm going to be sharing on Sunday morning in John chapter 5 how the Lord Jesus asked the question of a man that he's healing. Asked him the question, do you want to be made well? Sometimes the Lord will ask a question of us so that we can sort through everything and give to him what's really in the content of our heart. What do you want from me? I wonder, I wonder what the Lord has, has, has said to you when he has said to you, what do you want from me? What, what have you said in response to that? Lord, if Jesus were to, to ask you, think about that for just a moment. If, if Jesus were to ask you, what do you want from me? What would you say? My Anna, who is soon to be 25 years old, my Anna, when she was about four we used to give the family devotions, and I was going through a passage in the Scripture where Solomon had been told by God, ask, what is it that you want? And so I thought I'd be pastor dad and try and give my kids a good lesson. So I said to my kids, if God said to you, ask, and your request can be as high as the heavens, what would you ask him for? So my babies, you know, the older one, Corinne, was about 10, and so she already knew this. She knew, you know, the drill, if you will. Oh, I would ask him for all the people in the world to be saved, you know. Okay. And you know that, you know, spiritual. You know, little David, oh, that people, all the people who are sick would be well, and, and Joseph along the same lines. And so I turned to Anna, and I said, and baby girl, God would give you anything you wanted. All you have to do is ask him. What would you ask him for? Gum. <laughs> True story. Gum. That's how a lot of us are. Ask of me, what do you want? Gum, you know. <laughs> or he pointed a guy, bum. I mean, it's... What do you want? I, I, I want gum. I mean, I don't, really have, I don't really have deep thoughts and deep desires. 
But this guy did. This guy knew exactly what he wanted. He knew he, his opportunity had come. This is the one who has the ability to minister. This is the one who can meet my specific need, and so I'm going to make it as clear as possible, Lord, that I may receive my sight. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, and Jesus was reading this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus speaks to him, verse 42, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, Matthew, when he's given us insight, tells us that Jesus moved with compassion, touched this man's eyes. But we see that he received his sight immediately. And the result is he followed him. He followed him down that road. God still opens the eyes of those who are spiritually blind, and I do believe that he has the ability, should he choose to, to open the eyes of those who are physically blind. But God still has the ability to and does open the eyes of the spiritually blind that they might see Jesus Christ. That I might receive my sight. He doesn't always. But sometimes he does. That's what makes a miracle a miracle. As a freshman at Biola, we had a blind students association. There were several kids in our school who were physically blind and all, and so they had the opportunity to put on a, a chapel service for us. And as we entered into the chapel, all the windows had been draped, all the lights were turned off, and all the doors were closed. And we, several hundred students, were there in the gym in pretty much darkness. And as we sat there in darkness, a voice came over the loudspeaker, and it was the president of the uh, Blind Students Association. And, and he said, what you're experiencing right now is darkness. You can't see anything. You're seated in darkness. But in a few minutes, the lights are going to go back on, doors are going to be open, windows are going to be you know, um, opened and, and the light will again be in the room and you're going to be able to see. But we of the Blind Students Association, we blind Christians here at Biola, and the lights go on for you, we remain in darkness. We wanted to give to you a momentary experience of what our life is every day. We're in darkness. But before you begin to pity us. It is we who pity you. For I have never seen anything in my life. I have been born, I was born blind. I have never seen a thing in my life. But the very first thing I shall ever see is the face of Jesus Christ. And so I pity you. And for just a moment there, I thought, what a ripoff for me. For just a moment, because I value my sight. But the very first thing that I shall ever see, he said, is the face of Jesus Christ. Blind here, but seeing there. And to look into the eyes of Christ, his very first opportunity to see, Jesus still gives sight to the blind. He still does.